name is Martha Smith, and I'm an extension educator in horticulture. And you are here for the first of the 2015 Four Seasons webinar uh, series. Um, this year we're using Link. This is the new format. Uh, we're keeping our fingers crossed today that, that things are going to go smoothly. We really do appreciate your patience as we all um, work with this system and, and learn how to, how to use it. There were um, two handouts. Uh, actually, there was only one handout. You could either have it in the PowerPoint slide format or a slide list. You don't need to have both. The PowerPoint slides, of course, will go picture by picture. The two-page slide list talks about a lot of the introductory stuff, and then it has a list of the um, specific Semper Vivums that I'm going to be talking about. So with that, um, you should now see the title slide, Super Semper Vivums, with my uh, picture on there. So hopefully everyone is seeing that. Because we're going to talk about Semper Vivums today. And this group of plants, commonly called hens and chicks, has risen to, to new heights. A plant that was once left to fend for itself in that often neglected corner of our grandmother's garden is, is now hot. It's popular. Uh, Semper vivums, or simply called SEMPS, S-E-M-P-S, are popping up as trendy wall art. I've seen them as wedding cake decorations. I've seen lavishly planted wreaths. I've seen boutonnieres. Uh, uh, table centerpieces where they've used them. You know, this once lowly plant has now really uh, gotten to be very, very popular. And I think it's the unusual shaped rosettes of those plump, succulent leaves that um, give us that, that concentric feel, that this that pattern that really makes them very, very attractive. I became fascinated with uh, Semper Vivens about mm, nine or ten years ago when I went to the flower factory, which is south of Madison, Wisconsin. And they had a very large selection. And back then, I would pick out, oh, maybe five or six. And I'd plant them in the garden. And to be honest, I, I kind of ignored them. A lot of my earlier selections don't have tags anymore. And this is one of them. I not sh exactly sure which one it is, but it's been tucked into one of my screed beds among the boulders, and it's doing very well. This is another one that I started out with about nine years ago. Lost the tag. I don't really care. Just has that beautiful red, red coloration in the spring. You're going to find with these that a lot of their best coloration is going to be in the springtime or the cooler parts of the year with the shorter days. Here's another one that was just tucked into some boulders. And they look like these little velvet two-tone roses. I'm. They're still there eight, nine years later. Um, I've taken some out. I've, I've uh, divided them. But they're still chugging along. They do very well in our Illinois winters. Now, this is a very close relative. And I'm going to talk about these guys later. Later, This is a, a Joby Barba species. And this one is called roller type. And I'll talk about the Joby Barbas in a later slide. Here, another one I tucked in about nine years ago with that nice glaucous blue coloration and those tips. You know, they just look like they're, they've are they been tipped in a, a lavender ink well. It, it's just gorgeous. Here, this is one of my oldest plantings. And I, I hate to say this, but I planted it in a very neglected spot. And several years later, I noticed how it was filling up that corner so nicely, so perfectly. And then there's the spring color echo with the uh, lavender phlox with the purple tips of the Semper Vivum. And it's been there for years. Here's 
Yep, this is another neglected slumber vivum, uh, kind of a grayish uh, coloration with a little burgundy in the center, uh, thin strap-like leaves. And again, it was one of my earlier ones, so uh, the tag is long since gone, but I, I really like having it in that spot. Now, with Semper Vivums, there's such variety. That's, that's the amazing part of this, this genus. It's easy to tell a Semper Vivum, but when you start to get into the species and how many crosses we have, there's, there's literally thousands that are in the trade. Here you're seeing um, the, the Mayfair Hybrid and the Semper Vivum Arachnidium by Roides. There we're getting into those and with that um, uh, spider webbing to it. You also see that with the Yukon snow. And that's a very popular species, the arachnoidiums. You're seeing in the lower left one called a glow. This one, as the, the offshoots are coming out, they take on kind of a goldish tone. The center has uh, copper tones. And then this, uh, the very center takes on some green. The uh, calcarium in the upper right corner, you're going to see some absolutely beautiful calcariums. In fact, the next slide is absolutely gorgeous. And in the lower corner, you're seeing that um, Semper Vivum, Director Jacobs. To me, that just looks like a little nosegay or a little bouquet just, just sitting in my garden. This is Semper Vivum calcarium, and to me, it, it almost looks fake. It looks like a tapestry. It looks like a quilt that was just thrown in the garden there amongst the rocks. And this has the outer uh, ring of rosettes that take on the purple tones. And then as you get toward the center, those leaves are just heavily tipped with that red color. And here, we're going to talk about times of year when the colors are the best. We're also going to talk about variations um, with altitude and different sunlights. Um, this, I, I would, I'd love to have this in my garden. I have yet to get uh, the calcarium, the straight species, but it sure looks beautiful. This was at uh, Burnaby Lake Gardens. This was a garden center up near Vancouver, British Columbia. And I was on a tour, and this was in their loading docks. And these are all individual Semper Vivum rosettes planted in three-inch three containers, getting ready to be shipped out. And it, it, it looked like a carpet. This just this mass of all of this, this uh, same texture and color. And there were several of us just clicking pictures of this. It just took on this tapestry form. It's good. Here we have the um, another uh, one at the Burnaby Lake Gardens. This looks like one of the Jovi Barbas. And the, the little balls that, that uh, come out, the rollers, again, it just looked like a, a tapestry. It looked like a piece of art. Again, here's a Glaucus Blue. This was all on the same loading dock, and it was just, you know, it went on and on and on, and it just looked, like I said, like a tapestry. So sometimes the Semper Vivums, they can be so simple. This was at a garden show, and they had this rock wall, and they had some um, spaces chiseled out, and they had planted the individual uh, Semper Vivum rosettes into this wall. So simple, yet there's so many out there. I was just looking through a book on hardy succulents talking about there's thousands of cultivars now in the trade because um, they readily cross with each other when they're in seed. And sometimes the, uh, the resulting plants are just simply beautiful. So what are we talking about today? Well, I call them SEMPs for short. They're small succulents with short, thick succulent leaves arranged in a circle. And I think it's that, that radial pattern, that, that circular look to how the leaves form that really give us, a, a, I don't know, to me it's a, a sense of, of beauty. I just love how they, they form and the colors they take on. And some of them have more 
thin strap-like leaves, as you see on the left-hand side. Some of them are lime green, some are gray-green, some take on burgundy tones. There's, there's so much variety. So when we talk about Semper Vivums, it's in, the word actually means always living. That's Latin. Semper plus vivum is always living. They are in the um, Saxifraga group. They are Crassulaceae, which means they are um, relatives of the jade. Also known as the Orpine family, where they store water in their leaves. So that's where you get that, that uh, commonality between members of the jade families and the Semper vivums. They occur Morocco to Iran, and they're closely related to the Jovi Barbas, which I'm going to show you, Aeoniums, Sedums, and Echeverias. They go by several common names, and probably the most popular is hens and chicks. But I'm going to show you um, house leeks, why they're called that. There's also Jupiter's beard and Thunder's beard. There, there's several different names that are out there. Now, they do offer us a remarkable progression of color changes throughout the year. I, I find in Illinois, in my garden, the colors are more, the most spectacular in the spring. Get out in about May, early June. The days are still short. There's cool temperatures. The colors are just phenomenal. Now, there are approximately 40 to 50 species uh, under the genus uh, Semper vivum. And they cross readily, resulting in fantastic selections. They're hardy to zone four. In fact, um, some of them hardy to zone three, which you know, getting up into uh, mid to northern Wisconsin and into Minnesota. Drainage is important. You don't want to put them into heavy loam clay soils that hold a lot of moisture. In fact, um, with with my gardens, I. I Try to add like some granite grit or some um, pea gravel because I do have a very very uh, rich loam soil. Full sun, um, but if you're in southern Illinois, very hot hot uh, days, maybe a little bit of light afternoon shade is good just to, to keep them um, still uh, turgid with the water, and grow them lean and mean. I, I don't do much to these guys. I, I just let them fend for themselves. Now, the approximately 40 to 50 species, there's, you can tell a Semper vivum, but when you get into the species, it gets to be difficult. And I'm going to show you when we get into the plant list um, that there's some that one, the three growers have named the plant the identical thing, but they look very different. So. As I've done the research into Semper vivums, I'm finding that I, a more definitive study really needs to be done and to um, categorize and organize all of these crosses. But there's a lot of them out there. So factors that affect color changes, well, day length, as I said, um, shorter day lengths in the spring and in the fall. Light intensity, what I have read is when you get up into the higher altitudes, you tend to have better colors. Soil temperatures, air temperatures, pH, fertility, don't feed them with a lot of nitrogen. It's going to push more of a green growth and not give you those colors. Soil moisture, texture, and age of the plant. But for the, the Semper vivums, their best color is going to be in the spring. Now this is in my garden. This is Whirligig. And Whirligig in April, definitely burgundy tones, just a nice, nice uh, flush of reds and, and a little bit of maroon. And there's Whirligig in June as the days are starting to warm up. They're starting to get longer. And it's starting to fade out from those really intense, intense colors.
Some of the other names, Live Forever seems to be a common name. Another is House Leak, and this is um, kind of some uh, uh, lore where they were grown on rooftops in Europe between thatching tiles or timbers, and the thought was it would guard the home against thunderbolts, storms, sorcery, and to ensure the prosperity of the occupants. So that's the history behind house leaks. Hens and chicks, um, the, the mother rosette is the hen. The lateral offshoots that are connected by a stolen are the chicks. Oh, and I just realized I spelled Jupiter wrong on this slide. It's not Jupiter's beard, it's Jupiter's beard. Uh, Jupiter's beard is a common name, um, uh, Roman god uh, Jupiter. Then there's also um, thunder, um, Thunderbeard, and that has to do with uh, the god of thunder, uh, Thor. So there's a lot of history behind these. Another common name, uh, cats and kittens, old man and old woman. And they do have the um, tendency to live for a long time, they can survive up to three months without water. Now let's talk about their growth and reproduction, because this is where I, I do get a lot of questions. Summer vivums grow as tufts of perennial but monocarpic rosettes. They produce asexually primarily, and that asexual production are those lateral offshoots or offsets, or call them the chicks from the mother hen, um, they will f uh, flower. Typically, the plants or that rosette will grow for several years before flowering. But once they start to flower, that rosette sends up the flowering stalk, like you see here in this picture, flowers, set seeds, and dies. And that's what monocarpic is. Um, they will bloom one time. Now, they can produce sexually by seed. So when they are in bloom, any other sempervivum in the area, there's a good uh, chance that they'll cross. Self-pollination is difficult just because of the, the, the way the flower is formed. But here, this is where if you can collect those seeds and grow them on, you should get some really interesting uh, sempervivums to, to pop up. The um, interesting thing is when I've gone to order these or look online, so many times when I'll, I'm seeing the ordering information, they'll say, um, something like guaranteed not to bloom the first year because they really don't know. We really don't know what age or if it's growing conditions or what's going to trick that rosette to go into bloom. So a lot of the growers will say, um, you know, guaranteed not to bloom. If it blooms, contact us. Um, one one grower said, you know, just work with me on this. I try to ship what I think is not going to bloom, but we can't tell. And some growers will send you two rosettes in case one blooms. But that's they they do bloom out. But there's usually so many other offshoots and offsets that you can't really tell. The flower color is reddish, yellowish, pinkish, sometimes with a white coloration, and. On the Semper Vivums, the flower, flowers are actinomorphic like a star and have six petals. Now, when they bloom, that um, rosette blooms out and then dies. So here, what you're seeing, this was the, uh, one that was tucked into a stone wall that I had. And the center rosette matured to a point where it send, sent up a flower. But you can see all around it, there's a lot of the um, offshoots that just keep on you know, chugging along. What I did with this one is I just took a little hand trowel and I dug out the remains of that um, dead rosette in the center, and the plant quickly filled in. This way, the asexual way of propagating is, is the easiest because they will send these offshoots off, which then root and become independent of the parent plant, and then that connecting stolen will wither away. This was another one um, in my garden, and you can again see that the center rosette 
bloomed and died, but I can see, you know, one, two, three, four fairly good sized rosettes that are probably rooted. And then you can see off of those numerous small little rosettes that are connected by the, connected by the stolons. So that is just, it's just a normal occurrence. And this is what uh, makes them so easy to propagate, is when you can dig up those um, chicks, those offshoots that have rooted, you can just pop them out, plant them up, and they're, they're going to be good to go. Now, the Jovi Barbas and the Jovi Barba rollers, they're closely related, and they're often mixed in the trade. In fact, I think I have several Jovi Barbas that were sold to me as Semper Vivum. The flowers um, on the Jovi Barbas are bell-shaped or campanulate. And you see the Jovi Barba flower on the yellow, on the uh, right side, compared to the actinomorphic flower of the Semper Vivum, which is star-shaped, and that's on the left side. And you see the flowers, and this is where in, you know, lore, they are supposed to resemble the beard of God and considered sacred to Jupiter in Roman and Thor in Nordic mythology. So that's where they get uh, Thunder Beard um, and Jupiter Beard as their common names. Jovi Barba rollers, there's four species that produce these offsets in a similar way. The offsets are born on short, very fragile, upright stolons. And then they become dry, and they detach very, very quickly, and they roll away from the parent plant. So that's where they get their name, Joby Barba Rollers. And some of these can be extremely colorful. And what I have found and what I have read is the Joby Barbas also have good coloration in the fall as the days are getting shorter. So their flower is different how they send off their offshoots are different, and then um, their coloration time can be a little different. Now, the Jovi Barba hufelii is the fifth species, and it is distinctly different. It doesn't have the rollers. The rosettes divide themselves by producing their offsets in a sessile fashion. And if you look between the older leaves, that's how they form. They almost look like they're squished in there. So the new offshoots form between older leaves. And to propagate them, they have to be cut out. Um, I have not tried to propagate any of my Hufeli eyes, but you would have to get in there. You'd have to get uh, take a good piece of that plant out um, in order to get that enough of that little offshoot to, to root. So here, just a couple of different Joby Barbas. You see the roller. On the left, you can see that little roller forming, the rollers on the sides. There's a couple other roller types around it. And then the um, Hufelii type. And you now can see what I mean, how they, um, they, they start to get this kind of smushed look, because they're forming between the old, older leaves. So it's, it's, a different, it's a different look. This is a Joby Barba globiferum. Um, and the uh, offshoots form. They're forming just around the outer edge. They're taking on kind of that greenish lime, a little bit of burgundy tone. Um, and then you have the rosette in the center. Uh, the one over on the um, right is also uh, the same um, species. And you can see those little balls forming just as they're getting ready to wither and drop off and, and roll away. This is Jovi Barba Hufelii Goldbug, and there's several in the trade. I just have found them um, to be somewhat uh, mixed, because sometimes when I see uh, Jovi Barba, it's actually sold as a Semper Vivum. Here you have Hufelii Bora. I like the two-tone burgundy green center. Here is Corstiana.
And here we have angel wings, taking on kind of a blue glaucous uh, pink tinge to it. Very interesting. Now this is the Jovi Barba roller in my garden. And I've had it there for, for several years. They just produce those little offshoots, the stolen withers. They break away. They roll away. They're very easy to root. If you would pick those up, put it the stolen side down in some media, they should root very easily for you. Um, and they do have good coloration spring and fall. Now, some close relatives that have also gained popularity in recent years, the Echeverias and the Aeoniums. And we're seeing these used more and more um, in containers. Now, for us, uh, we have to treat these as annuals. Maybe in far southern Illinois, you might get away with uh, being a perennial. But for us, we have to treat them as annuals, um, either let them die in the fall or bring them in and overwinter. The aeoniums, um, uh, what I have found, they are also monocarpic. They will send up a flowering stalk, and then that rosette will die. And I, in my travels, I found some really interesting uses of these plants. This is Echeveria, and this is Minter Gardens in British Columbia. And they had this whole lizard uh, uh, designed out of Echeveria, and I thought it was very, it was very whimsy. This was also at Minter Gardens, and here it was time for tea, and they had the cup and saucer outlined with Echeveria, the words outlined, and then they used begonias. I thought it was an interesting way of using the plant. And I also have come across lots of ideas on how to use them. I look at this container, and it, it just looks like a, you know, a miniature rock garden. Uh, the, the, um, looks like they have some bark pieces or some driftwood pieces in there. And then they've planted the sempervivums around them, and they've got these very nice colonies. You can also see some of the monocarpic rosettes that are popping up and, and, and blooming. To me, I just think that, that the textures and the colors are so interesting. And do notice it's, it's in a gravelly um, media, especially with the mulch around it, is more of a gravel. This was a, a stump at one of the garden centers we visited. It, uh, a tree had blown over. Uh, the center was starting to rot out, so they put some uh, soil in it. They planted a sempervivum. And it started to creep and grow up into that cavity. And I just thought, wow, that looks, that looks nice. Lots of container ideas. Think about mixing the colors. Here you see the uh, white webbing of one of the arachnoidium types. Um, there's some calcariums in there with their red tips. And then in the center, you have one that's definitely taking on that burgundy tone. So experiment. Have fun and, and mix the different colors. Another container taking out some of the um, pink tones, the different textures. Again, definitely a larger one in the center. Um, but you can, really, you can really get some nice combinations. Here, this was at a garden center. And they had baskets of a very large, strap-like uh, leaf sempervivum. And they just had them in kind of layers on this, this entryway. And then letting the um, offshoots hang down, very similar to what we do with um, strawberry plants and some of the strawberry begonias, just letting them drape over that container. Here, this is in my garden. This is Gray Dawn. Uh, they work very well if you do any type of miniature landscaping. And this is one that I'm just not sure if it's a Jovi Barba type or some type of cross, because it does have the offshoots, but some of them are very, very tightly set in between the older leaves. Okay. 
containers. I just this caught my eye. There was uh, sedums, semper vivums, all sorts of things in there, and the colors just just popped as you got closer, and you saw the the, the white uh, spider types up against those purples. Throw in a couple blues. Very very nice. This is at Phoenix Perennials. He's a friend of mine with a garden center just outside Vancouver. And he decided to take some old birdhouses and plant them up. There's, there's so much, you, so many ways you can use these. Here is another one that he had some um, semper vivums and some different sedums. Almost looks like he's got a euphorbia there off to the side. Another colorful combination of semper vivums. It looks like there's a Luisia in there, an Aeonium, a Calancho. Just so, to me, that's just a, a beautiful bouquet. Get in and look closer and see how those colors are playing off one another. And again, just another close up shot. Succulent wicker basket with some semper vivums, and it looks like one of the crashulas, one of the donkey tails. Wreaths, very popular. Um, I used to plant up some wreaths, and I've always found I had better luck if I got them planted early in the spring and let them grow on and, and start to fill in. Um, they can just be gorgeous to have. Somewhat of a challenge as you get into the northern climates for overwintering. And this wreath um, definitely bringing in uh, more of the Crashulaceae uh, members, the jade members, the Echeverias, but uh, just beautiful. Some other shapes that people uh, have either sent me pictures or I found online. I think the heart was a nice shape to the left. The center, they just took a round topiary form and um, filled it with soil, lined it with moss. And that's all that is, where they just tucked in the semper vivums and some sedums. The one on the far right was at Mobot. And this was their take on a gazing ball. And they have some of the Angelina. Um, Sedum and then the Semper Vivums uh, creating that uh, stripe-like pattern. Now this I was hoping to show you beautifully planted with Semper Vivums. I bought this at one of our garden centers here up in the Quad Cities. It's a planting box. It's about, oh, I'd say 24 inches by 18 inches. It's about four inches deep. They filled it with soil, then stapled um, weed fabric over the top, and then put the moss, and then stapled the lattice over that. And I thought, wow, wouldn't this look really nice with these beautiful semper vivums just tucked in there, doing their own thing. So I had it planted up. I set it out. And a skunk came along and dug out about half of it. So I said, OK. And I tried it again. And this time, I put it up higher um, in the garden, not on the ground. And same thing happened. So I have to figure out a place that you can hang it. I just don't know if I have a wall where I could hang that. So just imagine this, this full of Semper Vivums. This was um, on a garden walk um, up in Detroit. And this garden was, was phenomenal. But I noticed this statue of this little girl running and looking down. And when I went up to her, she was running through this uh, little uh, uh, lake of Semper Vivums. And I thought, that was very sweet, very low maintenance. Now, this was um, Thomas Hobbs. And this was in Vancouver. I did not see this house. It has since been sold. And this is all gone. 
but you might have seen this. It was in several garden magazines years ago. Um, I think he was on Martha Stewart. And he took this house, this kind of, um, you know, Arizona stucco colored house. And on that railing, that, that banister, um, he created a chicken wire um, uh, planter where he put soil and um, moss. And it was just chocked full of sedums and sepervivums and echeveria, just giving you ideas. Now, I do realize here in Illinois this wouldn't be able to survive our winters, but it might give you some thoughts and ideas of, of how to use these plants. Here we have the same banister, but they tucked in some little glass ornaments. Um, it just really made the, the colors pop. And unfortunately, they sold the home, and the owners, the new owners, took this out. I've also seen them being used in weddings and other celebrations. I've seen them used in bouquets and Christmas ornaments, cake decorations. Uh, I like the little. Uh, table setting pieces or table uh, placemats for you um, with your name. Uh, the lower left, those are just in some um, plastic metal looking goblets and they put the little semper vivum. Looks like a little rose sitting there. That was very sweet. And I was in a, at a wedding in Coal Valley in 2013. I was working on this program and wow, there on the cake it's decorated with Semper Vivums. The um, boutonnieres had Semper Vivums in there. I didn't get a picture of the bouquet, but they, it also had Semper Vivums in there. Another thing that I would like to see Semper Vivums used more is in green roofs. Green roofs, um, it's, it, at their most basic, what they are, it's a shallow layer of soil spread across a specially um, designed rooftop. And it has these thick colonies of drought tolerant plants. Um, I usually see them with um, sedums, but I think this is a perfect opportunity to um, have some vivums included in there. And this is why, if you look at this um, slide I have, there's usually some type of uh, per, uh, layer up against the rooftop. And then there's depends on the system, various types of drainage layers. But if you look at that layer five, the brown layer just under the plants, that's what they have to grow in. And it's not a lot. Sometimes that's only maybe an inch, inch and a half. And that's where I think Semper Vivums could really do well. They're tough. They're drought tolerant, uh, sometimes don't need water for up to three months. So here, this is just a mixture up on a green roof. And I just thought it would be a nice way if anyone is into um, green roofs. A lot of times what we see are these pre-planted systems. And I just think the Semper Vivums would, would go very well. With that, um, the rest of the program, I'm just going to go through cultivars. If there's uh, any questions at this time, I haven't seen any in the chat. Martha? Yes? We have a question in Vermilion County. Um, what is a good potting mix for the scents that are in containers? Um, a good potting mix. I like to mix my own. I would probably go with some type of uh, cactus mix and a potting mix and mix them together. Um, I've really gotten into building my own screes, so I'm mixing all sorts of stuff. But I did find a good cactus mix. Um, it was a uh, over in Chicago at a garden center, and I was mixing that in with um, my potting soil. The cactus mix had um, uh, grit, it had ground up volcanic rock, it had some um, core, some coconut fiber in there, um, and they seemed to do just fine. So if you can find something that's good drainage, mix it in with a little bit of potting mix, you'll be good to go. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to trouble you one more time. We had a second question come in real quickly. Um, what about the pH of the soil? You know, I've what I have read is um, pH does affect the coloration, but I haven't been able to find out how. Um, more um, acidic, I'm not sure if that gives them more of their lighter tones or if it's more alkaline, if it's the deeper tones. That is something I still have to do some research on. I'm, Like I said, I've only been dabbling with these for about nine years, and there, there's a lot to learn. <laughs> Thank you. We have a question in Boone. Hi, this okay. is Stephanie here. Um, I, I have a question regarding back on your uh, your screen that says, uh, the, you know, live forever, and it says, how snakes grow grown on rooftops between thatching, blah, blah, blah. I thought to guard against thunderbolts, storms, sorcery, and to ensure the prosperity of the occupants. Um, is that in the Western world, or would you say that that was back um, where they, their homeland is, which is what, Iran to... I think you're, I'm going to show a picture of that coming up. I'm going to show a picture on some tile roofs. So it's definitely more in climates where they would have a tile or a thatched roof. Yes. I don't think here on our shingled roofs we'd have very good luck. Okay, no, I'm, I'm, I'm asking, the question is that I, I'm asking is this. Um, obviously those, uh, that plant form did not um, originate in our uh, climates here in the Western world, mm -hmm. um, but it's somewhere over in the Eastern Hemisphere, where we have told us. Mm -hmm. I'm curious when they started to be brought into, say, Europe first, probably, and then over here. Do you have any idea of the history of its uh, um, travel from its um, to uh, this area? Great question. You can research it and get back with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry. I, I'm more into the plant. Um, I'm, sh I'm sure there is. I am sure there is. Um, and if you want to email me, um, I do have some really good um, reference material. Um, and maybe between the two of us, we can figure it out. Okay, one more question. And I know I have another one, but I can't find it because I'm writing them on the different screens. Um, Regarding the, the blooming stalk, mm -hmm. can we prevent that rosette from dying by just cutting that ro that stalk off to prevent it from blooming? You know what they say is it's not uh, it's not necessarily the process of the flowering, but it's or the the stalk itself, but it's the chemical reactions that go on in that um, that uh, flowering stalk. So it's the chemical when they go when they start to form the flowers when they're in bud. I I can't. Say I, if you cut it out, usually when they bloom, I have such a big clump that losing a couple of them really isn't that uh, big a deal. <laughs> but there's a chemical reaction that that goes on in in there, and that's what kills it. Okay, I just thought I'd ask. Sure. Thanks. Um, I see um, questions. Do they have any pests? I have Googled. I have looked in my references. Um, they will, if they're in too wet a soil, they will get a root rot. I read in one reference um, some leaf miner issues. Um, so no, I haven't found, well, except that skunk um, going after that, that planter box. Um, do they survive the winter outdoors? Yes, they do. And many of them are evergreen. Um, they survive up until zone three, which as I said was going into, you know, mid to upper Wisconsin and Minnesota. Um, I'm sure bees pollinate the flowers. I can't exactly say what type of pollinator, but I I, I see them buzzing around. I can't say for sure what kind. Um, deer resistant. They've never eaten mine. Yeah, several people have asked about deer resistance. I've not had an issue except like, and that skunk just dug them out. He didn't eat them. He just dug them out. So I don't know if there was something in the mix that they were going after or whatnot. Someone asked about that that container. Um, um, it's it's a box. It's 24. It's roughly 24 by 18. It's about four inches deep filled it with soil, they stapled weed fabric over it, put moss, 
and then stapled that lattice. Um, so if anyone wants more information and wants more details, you can email me. Where do I buy my SEMPs? Wherever I can find them. Um, I'm venturing to some online sources. I've never done that before. Uh, wherever, wherever I find them and it's something unusual, you're not paying a lot for some of these guys, you know, I might buy a three inch Semper Vivum for, you know, five, six, maybe seven dollars compared to what I pay for some of the other plants I collect, like, you know, dwarf conifers and oddball perennials. So um, it's, it's not a huge investment. And, it, you know, sometimes it's simply the hunt. You know, you can find the plants, but sometimes the hunt to go out and find them is, is what's fun. Are they hardy on walls in the winter? I have them in rock walls, and they've come through just fine. It's going to be your drainage, especially this time of year going into when it's cold and wet. They've got some good drainage, a little bit of protection. You, you should be fine. I mean, zone th we're zone 5. They're hardy to like minus 30, some of these guys. So they're pretty tough. Okay, with that, let's um, continue on. Um, I will stay on afterwards and answer questions. Um, but I just wanted to go through the plants that I have uh, in your list. This, if you just have the plant list, this is the starting with the arachnoidiums. Um, and, you know, don't blame me when you get addicted. That's what I tell people with any of these odd plants that I've come to collect, because it, it can be an addiction. The um, Semper Vivum arachnoidiums are the cobweb hen and chicks, and there's a lot of variety here. Um, when they open, they have this um, um, fiber. That's the only way that I understand it. And as they, as they pull apart, as they grow, it, it just forms. And some of them form very thick, to the point where the Semper Vivums, they don't even look real. They look like they're plastic. This is Arachnoidium variety rubrum. I just love this red coloration and then with the, the white uh, spider webs on them. This one I don't have. I would love to have this. And here we have Pygmalion. And this is one of the really dense, dense webbing. Now, I've had some struggles with the arachnoidiums, especially those that are this thickly webbed. Got to give them good drainage. And they're also slower to form, at least my experience, they're slower to form the offshoots. So you want to give them really good drainage. I would also recommend not a full hot, hot sun situation. Give them a little bit of afternoon shade. Now, the next three that I'm going to share with you are all named um, Semper Vivum Arachnoidium subspecies tomentosum, and they, they all look different. Um, they're from being grown in different parts of the country, so maybe it's their environment, maybe it's the time of year that these pictures were taken, maybe it's the maturity level. But as I said earlier, the genus Semper Vivum is easy to recognize, but the species, because there's so much uh, cross-pollination and so much uh, variety, that that's where it's getting a little bit muddied. You can take a single clone, and you can take, like this clump here, take you know three of those little offsets and put them in completely different gardens around the state, and they would probably take on different colorations, probably a little bit of a different growth habit. So this is where I'm finding a little bit more research and um, classification of these plants. Because this is Arachnoidium sub subspecies tomentosum. And then this is listed as Arachnoidium subspecies tomentosum. A lot more uh, burgundy to this. I don't know if this was taken right in the spring, just as they're coming out of their, you know, the winter. And then here, the white is also listed as Arachnoidium subspecies tomentosum. So I, I share this with you because 
you know, it's, uh, there's some gray areas um, with this plant. Uh, I think this is a, a beautiful um, arachnoidium. They almost, like I said, look plastic. They're so covered. Um, and do notice that's kind of on a mounded um, planter with uh, really good drainage. So, you know, don't get frustrated if you see something in one um, reference and then you see it someplace else. Same name, but looks a little bit different. This is Pekingese, and this is uh, Arachnoidium, and it's um, crossed with a, uh, that Hufelii. Um, again, in some books, they haven't broken that out into a Jovi Barba. They keep it in the Semper Vivums. I just think that looks like a little bouquet, uh, roses, uh, two-toned with the white centers. And all of these, you know, they're all staying low. You might have some with longer strap-like leaves that might push up to maybe eight inches or so, but for the most part, they're, they're ground hugging. This is that cal calcarium, and I just love this. I love how the outer rosettes uh, take on the red tones, and then as you get toward the center, the green leaves are tipped uh, with a red. This is the straight species. And this one's called Extra. And I just think that just that symmetry, that balance, it, it, it just looks like its own little piece of, a piece of art. This is Martin. Martin definitely has a lime green cast to it. And its tips are very lightly colored. And this is the calcarium that I have in my garden. This is Sir Lawrence. Um, he's he's slow. He's really slow. Because this is May 2013, and I still don't have any offshoots from him. Um, I, I think what I should do is probably get rid of some of that organic mulch, bring in more of a gravelly mulch. Um, but I'm just hoping that one of these years, uh, he just pops <laughs> and starts to send me a lot of offshoots. And here, um, as we had earlier, the question, this is the Semper Vivum Tectorum, and this is the one that you, you see uh, the, the house leak, the common house leak. And you know, I'm looking at my notes right here, and they're saying in the Alps, the most uh, distributed species are the Semper Vivum Tectorums. So at some point, they've, they ended up in the Alps up in, you know, more of the mountainous areas. So there is um, you know, some, some history to this. Uh, so whoever that asked questions, I'll be happy to share. And here again, you're seeing them on the rooftops to guard against thunderbolt storms and sorcery. And I can only assume that they found cracks and crevices within those um, um, tiles where their roots can go down and find some type of uh, organic matter and moisture. And then you see over on the left, it's just kind of tucked into a, a could be a rock wall. Sun waves. This is in my garden. Uh, sun waves. This is June 2013. Nice little uh, Semper Vivum. Uh, good coloration. Just really pops open for me with the nice um, pink tones and then kind of uh, fades out to a green on the outer leaves. This is another red one that I saw at a trade show. This is actually an introduction by um, Walters Gardens. Um, and I really like how they've got the, um, uh, the sedum, the Angelina, that lime green color. And it just picks up the uh, color tones in the eyes of those burgundy Semper Vivums. And this one's called Rock and Roll. Now, Flamingo, uh, it's really um, known for its colorations, where it has that striping between a deeper burgundy and a light pink. It has long, strap-like leaves, a uh, very point, pointed look to it, but a little bit serrated edge. And this is one that's cold hardy to zone 3, which is minus 30 to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So that, that's a pretty hardy plant. Here we have King George. And again, I'm, I'm 
picture, this is a cross between that hufeliae with the, how those um, some of those offsets are coming very tightly in between the old leaves, yet at the bottom you're getting some lateral offshoots. Twilight blues in my garden, this nice little plant. I like the uh, glaucous blue, and then those tips just look like they've been dipped in, you know, a violet, you know, violet inkwell. Just a little bit of uh, color on the points. Now, I don't have this one, but I sure want it. And this is called Blue Moon. And the coloration is just phenomenal, kind of that burgundy purple green. This is another Walter's introduction. This is Pacific Blue Ice. Very nice um, shaped rosette, nice, nice um, glaucous color, a little pink in the center. And again, I saw this planted uh, on a garden tour when I was up in the Northwest. Semper Vivum Virgil. Very strong lavender tones that then fades to a blue in the center. And look at all those offshoots. Look at all those laterals just rooting in, and then you have those to give away or plant elsewhere. This is Ginny's Delight. And again, it's the same plant. The uh, picture on the left taken early in the spring. Picture um, on the right later on, about midsummer, br definitely bringing on more of that arachnoidium webbing in the center. But same plant, just different times of year. This is Butterbur. This is in my garden. I took the picture um, on the right, May 13, 2013. And unbeknownst to me, about a little over a month later, you see how that's elongating? And it's going to flower. So I lost that one, but I still had those other two. And you know, the question was, could you cut that out? I don't think you'd, you'd get the shape back. I don't know. I could try that. But you know, it's I don't know what clicked that, you know, if it's a maturity thing or just some signals in the plant. But it bloomed, and I lost that rosette. These are the crustatas. The, uh, they look like they're growing side by side. Just an unusual kind of novelty, Semper Vivum. Now, here is um, the same, I think it's the same plant. Uh, the one on the left is planted up near Dubuque, uh, north of Clinton, Iowa, um, in a, my friend Dave's garden. And the one on the right is in my garden. They are identical plants. They have more of a tubular leaf. And then the tip is burgundy and kind of has a little cup to it. But when Dave bought his, it was called Oddity. And when I bought mine, it was called Weirdo. So same plant, probably discovered by different growers, and they gave it a different name. Migrette. Uh, another one I'm on the hunt for. I just love that thin strap-like leaf with the lime center and the burgundy tips. And here, just growing in a pot, which I know a lot of collectors just keep the, theirs in, in pots. This is Utopian. And um, Utopian, again, on your left is June 2nd in Dave's garden. And the one on the right is May 13th in my garden. You know, same coloration. Uh, Dave's looks a little bit more flat to the ground. Mine's a little bit more upright in the center. So you know, just some slight variations. Old copper. This is uh, Dave's garden. And that one I showed you in the very beginning that was bright red in the spring. I, I'm thinking that's what I have is old copper. Now, I call this one Le Plow. I'm, 
I don't know if that's the right pronunciation, but I wanted to share this with you. Um, I've had this one now going on probably six, seven years. It's getting to be a fairly nice size clump. This was June 6, 2013. And then I came back just about two weeks later. And can you see on the left, you see how the rosettes are starting to elongate? I think I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, about eight of those that were starting to elongate. And there you see it July 14th in full bloom. Yeah, I lost all those rosettes, but I just popped them out, plant filled in, and it's still chugging along. But why did that happen? Was it getting too tight? Uh, was it reaching a maturity? Um, don't know. Here's another uh, one of the velvety ones, Pyrenaecum. Just those little soft fuzz to them. Silverine kind of has a uh, silver center, kind of a coppery outer ring. And it's just doing fine, just chugging along, just growing. Look at all the ones that you could pop out and plant elsewhere. Purple Beauty, going into sending up all those uh, rosettes. And actually, I, do, I don't think that looks bad. I kind of like that. I kind of like that look. Here we have Red Ace, definitely a strong red coloration. And this one, I think, is one of those calcariums, Candabricum picos de Europa. Just beautiful red coloration with the green centers. So I hope I've given you some thoughts and ideas. Uh, there's a lot of variety out there. You can do a lot with these plants. I mean, this was a flat that they had at a garden center. And it just, to me, again, just looked like um, just a piece of art. So with that, any questions? We have one here in Boone again. Mm -hmm. um, I must say, I was looking for this book earlier at our earlier question session. Um, regarding the, uh, when they divide and how they, you know, whether they actually step right off their or divisions themselves or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, for those that don't separate off their divisions, um, you know, like the roller does usually, um, is there a point that not dividing them or helping them along with separating them? Is there a point of, of they're getting so congested that it'll affect the growth of the plant or the appearance? Well, that's what I meant with that last one. You know, why did it was it getting too tight? Was that was that a sign that yes, it needed to maybe that was its way of naturally thinning out that that large clump um, that it could be because people have argued that that they send them up, you know, to to thin out because they know that you know they're they're going to die and, and be gone. You know, with some of the sempervivums, and I, I'm not sure I understand the question, but if you divide them, if they haven't rooted. Um, what you can do is you can cut the stolen and then let it set. Let it let it be exposed to air, maybe for about a maybe a half day, you know, eight, twelve hours, maybe a day. Because we know as um, sedums and sempervivums, as they begin to dry out, they, they start to form a callus. And when they start to form callus, natural occurring auxins in the leaves travel down to that wound. And auxin is a natural rooting hormone. So a lot of times they'll say, cut them, let them dry so that you start to get that callus, and then pot them up. Um, so if, if you're finding that they're not rooted, you, you might want to try that. Can I elaborate on the reeds? I have a whole hour-long program on, on reeds. Um, it's you, you make it, you make a, a, I take two, uh, Reef forms, metal reef forms. I line them in moss. I run a, a tube of soil that I wrap in paper towels down the center. 
put the other wreath on top, cover it with moss, and wire it. I mean, it's it's a whole another hour long program. So I I mean, you can email me, and I can send you some information. Um, Hello. Yeah. I'm uh, okay. Go on. Um, I just have a question. I'm Jerry in DuPage County, mm -hmm. and um, I was wondering. If I plant these sempervivums in a container, do I have to bring the container inside then in the winter months? or? Um, I would. I wouldn't let them, you know, get, you know, freeze and thaw. Just put them into an unheated garage. Or if you want, sink the pots. Just if you've got like a, um, in my vegetable garden, I'll just take a section of it and I just sink the pots up to the lip, put a little mulch over it. Just so that those the root systems aren't going through that really uh, hard freezing and thawing, which some winters we get very, you know, uh, weather extremes, and others we don't. So I would I would just want to do some insulation to the roots. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I I have one other question. Sure. Um, um, that is, um, when you're planting these in a container, is it better to to plant more than fewer, or I mean, if you want, I mean, how soon would this fill in? Some of these don't grow very fast, right? So, yeah, no. Um, I if I'm doing a container, I might take you know three. A clump. It, it really depends on the size of the container and what I'm trying to do with it. If it's a small a small container, I might just be doing singles. It's really what my you know what my overall goal is for that. If I'm going to plant a lot of them, then it might fill in too quickly, and I might be, you know, dividing them out on a on a, a more quick basis. So I always go by that odd number. I might put three together, or maybe and then five over here, and maybe three again. But really, are you dealing with a 16-inch container, a 24-inch container, and how many of these do you have? So it, long answer, but there's really no rules. Have fun. We have another question in Boone. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you might have a list of nurseries that specialize in this type of plant for mail order. You know, I wish I did because I started a list last year and then some of them, um, I, they either have changed or I can't find them. Um, no, I, I, I don't because I have not ventured into mail order yet. I'm just starting that. Um, so no, so at this point I don't and I can't I can't make any recommendations because I really have no experience with them. If you guys know of any, send me the list. Someone said here they ordered from Emerald Coast Growers, a very well known grower, for a make and take class last year and they had a great selection and they were very healthy plants. I think Emerald Coast is going to be a wholesale operation, so you probably have to order quantity. Wintering indoors, bright light watering. Um, I put them in my shed in the containers. Um, so it's getting down to, well, the shed doesn't get anything below 36, and um, I do have a grow light going on out there, and I'm watering maybe once every six weeks. Okay, someone just shared a, a website on the chat window. Yeah, you don't bring them into your warm temperatures. These are, they, they, they need to have that cold. So, you know, let them, like I said, be out in a shed or something that's not going to go through that real extreme freezing and thawing. Are there any native stuff? I have not found any, any native, you're, you're talking native to North America. Um, I, I would have to do some research. I have not found any indication of native sempervivums. And I'm just I'm just going through these last slides just to give you some contact information. 
Can any be propagated by pulling off leaves? Huh. I wonder what shape they would form. No, I've never tried it. Um, I've done that with jade. I've done that with some of the other um, succulents. I have not done that with Semper Vivum simply because once they get established, you can usually, I, I get plenty. I get what I need for any other potting up. But I no, I can't say that. Does the webbing trap leaves debris and become problematic? Uh, no, I've not had it because um, it's usually so tight. Um, you could probably just take a leaf blower. OK, here is someplace St. Joseph has an excellent selection. They'll have a vendor booth at the McLean County Lawn and Garden Day on March 7th. Are any of them edible? You know what? Um, <laughs> I don't know. Um, I wouldn't want to try one. I don't, that I don't, I've never had that question, so I can't answer that, no. Have I had any natural crosses? No, not yet. And I'm not sure if it's positioning where I have one that's in bloom and the other one that's in bloom is on the other side of the house, and maybe I need to bring, you know, the pollen to the other plant and, you know, it manually cross-pollinate. Um, because I just haven't had um, good luck with uh, cross-pollination. I think it's just because they were you know, totally different sides of the house. Um, oh, Sharon's Nursery will also be at the Champagne Garden Walk on June uh, 20th. Good book, Succulent Containers, Deborah Lee Baldwin, uh, pH between 5.6 and 6. I don't have that one. I have one called Hardy Succulents by Gwen Kalaitis, um, very well-known plant person from Colorado. Um, just this last slide, uh, we do uh, now have a horticulture YouTube website. So if you want to review this or you want to view any of our 2014 programs, uh, we will have them posted. and. As we go through the 2015 series, we will be posting um, those programs also. If there's no more questions, um, I really would like to thank uh, Tom Ward for helping us today, and Kari and Candace were in the background helping us. Um, you have my contact information. If you have any questions or want to discuss any of this further, just send me an email or give me a call.